My name is Justin Gage, and you're tuned in to the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions Podcast with your host, Jason Woodbury. I saw the planet, I met the stars. If you're invited, stupid not to go. Welcome back. It's great to be with you all. My guest this week on the show is Jay Maskus of Dinosaur Jr. Along with Lou Barlow and Murph, he formed Dinosaur Jr. in Amherst, Massachusetts in 1984. After their original run, which ended very acrimoniously, when Barlow was dismissed in 1989, Maskus continued on with the Dinosaur Jr. name as well as uh, making some records with The Fog and plenty of side projects. But in 2005, the original trio returned with a new record called Beyond. And since then, they've been on a reliable hot streak. Most classic bands come back in some diminished form, but not Dinosaur Jr. Their latest is called Sweep It Into Space. It was produced by Kurt Vile with Jay Maskus. It's full of incredible riffs and that trademark melodic resignation. I really love it. It's one of my favorite records of the year so far. It was great to have Jay on to discuss it, along with uh, his solo work, early SST days, side projects, playing with his heroes, and a lot more. If you listen closely, you'll uh, pick up on the special audio appearance by Jay's dog, Candy. Before we get into the talk, though, Transmissions is supported by our Patreon community. Head over and check out Aquarium Drunkard over there. If you enjoy our show, please share it with your friends and leave a rating or review wherever you listen to the podcast. Okay, here we go. Me and Mascus. Jay's known for concise responses, but that meant we could cover a lot of ground. So we're all over the place with this one. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Transmissions. I'll speak with you more on the other side. Jay, thanks so much for taking the time to join me here on uh, Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. It's a real treat to have you here. Oh, thanks. So, Sweep It Into Space is a really, really good record. Um, I can't think of very many bands that sort of come back in their original incarnation and do it as consistently and with as much sort of new energy as you guys have. You've been continuing on making records this entire time there was no real break for you in terms of making stuff i wonder does it all feel like one thing or does dinosaur jr coming back together when it does sort of feel like its own unique thing for you Uh, i guess it's both yeah i mean in one sense it's just some other thing to do but um yeah you know, I realize we have some sort of energy together that's unique. The three the three of you guys, yeah. Yeah. At this point, do you feel like you've made a lot of different records and, and you guys have made a solid set of albums since returning? Uh, do they more or less come together, you know, easily now? I know that's not something that was always the case for Dinosaur Jr., but does it feel like it does come together more or less on its own at this point? Uh, no, it's still kind of similar. You still have to (laughs) kind of like... It's a grind, kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, what what is your... uh, We could could 
get a little bit more general. What what's your typical working day look like when it's either for solo stuff or other projects or or Dinosaur Jr. And is the process sort of different for you when you're working on stuff for yourself than it is with Dinosaur Jr.? Um, yeah, it's different, you know, because I'm writing the songs with uh, them in mind, you know, thinking if Murph could play this song or if this song might sound good if we played it live or something. So I have that in mind. And then... uh I mean, recording, yeah, I don't can't spend as much time as I used to recording. I'm like maybe good from 2 to 5 in the afternoon or something like that. I, I know some people like to record for like 16 hours straight. I just can't concentrate. Yeah, yeah. That long. Did you guys have this more or less recorded before the uh, the pandemic kind of pushed stuff back? Yeah, most of it. Um, I had to finish some stuff on my own, and uh, Kurt Vile was going to come back again, but he didn't. And uh, I had all the vocals done and the stuff. I had to do some guitars and some keyboards. Did it did it feel good to have sort of a project to to focus on, or were you focused on other stuff as well? Like in terms of making new stuff over the course of the last year, when you haven't been able to to be on the road. Yeah, I mean the whole album was done. I guess at the end of April, it was mastered or something, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, most of the year I've just been kind of doing a little bits here and there. I finished a instrumental album, Heavy Blanket album, and I've been trying to write some songs for a solo album, but not being too productive. Yeah, yeah, just uh I I was, you know, I was I was thinking about how how I have spent a lot of time over the last the last year and I wondered if you like me find yourself checking out like record stores online or cruising discogs and reverb to to find stuff it's kind of an interesting time to be a collector of of stuff right now because it's kind of a golden age but um it feels different than going out and digging for it I I wonder are you do you sort of comb around those sites yeah, <clears throat> I'm sure if I hear of a record that I want to get, I'll try to find it on Discogs or something. And so that's kind of, yeah, I don't, yeah, so I guess record stores, I don't go to as much because I have so many records and yeah, if I can think of a record or something comes up, I just try to find that one thing on yeah to scogs or something but yeah reverb i'm always looking at that and uh yeah all the prices of everything seem to be going up just in terms of just everything overall pedals and yeah equipment and stuff yeah and records too yeah record prices are when i mean when i got into records and you know this was a while ago you know it was was I could buy a lot more vinyl for less money, you know, and so I could just have a lot, a lot more music, access to music. Now it's now it's not that way at all, you know. CDs are where the the scores are right now. I don't know if you get into CDs still. I don't. Yeah. At all, yeah, but I could never. Uh, yeah, to me, CDs were like the big lie or something like a. You know, uh, I was told they were going to be indestructible, but they s- turned out to be even worse than records. You know, just um, I never took them that seriously, so they always ended up at the bottom of my car, all scratched up. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish it they had to come out with maybe the mini disc would have been better because you never touch it and it doesn't get scratched up. And so. Yeah, that that's one format that just sort of never took off at all, really. Aside yeah. from, I guess maybe were you were you did you have like a mini disc? Was that a way you would keep track of song demos or anything like that? 
It's so vague. I feel like I must have had one at some point. How do you? But or not? I didn't use it much. How do you keep track of of song demos? Do you do you do a lot of iPhone memos? Yeah, I have some iPhone app, some recording app, and then I email it, you know, to some different places. So I, so it exists somewhere. I had that happen over quarantine, like my. You know, all the ones on my phone were erased, but luckily I'd, I'd emailed them all somewhere. Yeah, yeah. You, I, 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 you, when the pandemic started, I really liked that you, you would share these sort of musical moments of solidarity on your, your Instagram. Uh, do you, uh, do you like Instagram overall? I don't have Instagram, so I don't really. I've looked at it a few times, but I don't know. I don't want to get involved really with it. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so does somebody run your Instagram for you? I suppose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it was a cool, it was a, it was a cool thing. Um, but I, I, yeah, it doesn't seem, do, do you, do you, are you a very online person or not really? Yeah, for sure, but I'm just not a social media, I yeah. guess, person. Yeah, yeah. I have one, the one social media I have is Strava for biking, but I think I only follow nine people, and nine people follow me or something. I don't yeah, it's open a pretty... it up too big. <laughs> yeah, have you spent a lot of the, I mean, you're, you're big into biking and, and, uh, skiing, right? Have have you been able to carve out time to do that over the course of the pandemic? Yeah, there's definitely been a lot of time for that kind of thing. Did you, did you like being off, off the road? No, I didn't like, like quarantine at all. Yeah, it was pretty difficult. I didn't like anything about it really. Yeah. Do you yeah. you guys have tour dates announced and uh you know they're still a, a ways off but uh does it feel good to have sort of that silver lining on the on the horizon that you are going to be able to get out and play some shows soon? Are you excited about playing shows for this record? Yeah. I'm not sure that you know that'll all happen but I guess it's good just to have some hope out there but yeah, I'm not really convinced it's going to happen so quickly, but uh, I guess having shows is good because if it, you can happen, then we can play. But if we just wait and wait, then I think they'll just be a glut of all these bands, you know, when everything does open and then maybe it'd be harder to pull it together. Yeah, that seem, it seems like it's going to be weird to have sort of everybody at on the road at once or, or, or at some, yeah. some sort of like log jam of bands getting out there. But, but do you still, do you still dig playing live quite a bit? Is that a, still a lot of fun for you? Yeah, I like it more now than I used to. There was a period in the nineties. I was kind of over it, but then I started getting more into it and yeah, I probably like it more now than I used to. What did, what did you at that stage what did you what did you dislike just the grind of it or what what was it that was bumming you out about it I'm not sure uh I guess I somehow just didn't appreciate it or something or um Yeah, I don't really know. At, the, at that time, did you still like playing in the studio? I mean, has the studio always been uh, more preferable for you in terms of musical expression? No, studio is always less preferable, for sure. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Just at some point in the 90s, I think I was just kind of jaded and burned out. I just couldn't deal with anything, and... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what was going on. How how did that how did that start to turn around? I mean, I I think back to 
Well, obviously, you made some great records in the 90s, and then around the point of the 2000s, you know, you made that great Fog record, and, you know, it it feels like there, and then all that kind of eventually sort of led back into the to the Dinosaur Jr. stuff and, and, and a bunch of your solo records. So it feels like something turned around for you. Do you have a sense of what it was? Yeah, The Fog, I was... Um maybe i was uh enjoying it more or something during that period and then uh but then that was strange i toured her a lot <clears throat> on the first fog album but then i got home after a year of touring and after playing all of these shows for a year, I was like down five thousand dollars. That was like, oh yeah. So that was kind of a bummer. Yeah, it's this sinking realization. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. I I've been thinking about how you know you have a a lot of side projects, and I was I was bouncing through sort of your discography, your extended discography to get ready for this, and I uh, hadn't. Listen to that Unknown Instructors record, the the most recent one, with you and Watt yeah. and George Hurley and, and others, like a bunch of SST pedigrees in that band. And I was wondering um, if you could tell me who some of your favorite SST bands, were, were you a fan of bands on that label uh, when you first got into music? Um, Yeah, big fans. I mean, that was... Uh... You know, that was kind of why we were formed Dinosaur. It was, uh, that's what we wanted to do. That was our goal, was to be on SST and and tour. And, uh, yeah, we liked all the bands on SST back then, for sure. I feel like if I could, if I was, if I got access to a time machine, but I had to, stay in the same place relatively geographically when I go back in time. I'm in Arizona, yeah. I'm in Phoenix, so I would want to go see the Meat Puppets sort of in that era, them or maybe yeah. Sun City Girls. Did you ever get a chance to see either of those bands? Yeah, yeah. And uh, also the Wipers moved to Arizona at that's some true. point. Too. That's true, Greg mm-hmm. Sage was, was out here, and uh, Ryan... There's a, a great band from here, too, called Destruction Unit, who he sort of had some uh, back and forth with, with him. Um, yeah, we got to play with the Meat Puppets, and I've seen them quite a few times. I guess the first time I saw them, they were opening for Black Flag. It was right when uh, Meat Puppets 2 came out, and uh, a lot of the punkers did not like this their new direction or something, but I, I always... We always really liked them. At, I mean, people would call us kind of like Meat Puppets Junior when we started out. We were kind of, they thought we were like ripping them off. Or Well, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really sound that way to me, but I do recognize that there's a little bit of a, those guys were like big into the Grateful Dead and stuff. There was an open embrace of a sort of more wandering musical direction. And I think about how... That's sort of evident in in even the earliest Dinosaur Jr. stuff too, a willingness to, to to maybe you know like I'm thinking of that that live '87 album where you guys open with like a seven minute version of Severed Lips or whatever. So it feels like by punk standards that's very very long, you know, by uh, by yeah. hardcore standards. Did you did you ever? I mean, did it ever bug you that that people didn't like a, a direction like that, or did you just not? not care really um you know i don't know of course you would rather be liked yeah i remember playing in boston an early show and you know people knew us from deep wound in boston and yeah the hardcore scene and yeah the the hardcore scene was not digging uh did not like us so that was (laughs) You know, it's a little disappointing, but we weren't really, obviously we weren't really 
trying to be liked as much as uh, just play music we wanted to do. I mean, we really hated in our town. We got banned from every club. What'd you guys get banned for? Was it bad behavior or? <laughs> Basically just, uh, I guess ha- being really loud and having no fans is a bad combination. <laughs> Like, because the, the bars hate you because they can't hear when people are ordering drinks and you're just annoying everyone, kind of. And yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that was the basic problem. We were just, you know, we were really stuck to our guns and we weren't, like, the nicest people or anything. We just wanted to do our thing and it's just... People were not into it here, I guess. You know, the first place we found any fans was in New York. Boston and Amherst were not into us at all. No? What What do you think? It, I mean, who did you guys play with? Who would you play with in New York? Well, our first show, we opened for Big Black, and that's when we met Sonic Youth. And So then, yeah, we... Sonic Youth and Pussy Galore came, moved to New York soon after. And, uh, I guess, you know, <clears throat> this kind of band's revolving around Sonic Youth. Yeah, yeah. I, f- I feel like I should ask, just in case the microphone picks it up, do you, g- do you have a snoring dog over there? Yeah. What kind of dog do you have, and what's your dog's name, if you don't mind? Candy, she's a bulldog. Oh well, she sounds adorable uh, via the old snores. Um, that's yeah, she definitely. I've been doing some interviews, and people have noticed for sure. <laughs> she, I'm gonna, I'm gonna credit her, her as a guest on the podcast too. Um, yeah. Well, you know, you've made we 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 talked a little bit about. You mentioned Kurt Vile. Um, he worked with you on on your first solo album under your own name too, and you guys yeah. you guys recorded a, a dead cover for the um, Day of the Dead compilation and some other stuff. Um, it, Kurt seems like a pretty cool guy to hang out with. Uh, what inspired you guys to get together for work together on this this new album? Um. I think like our record label wanted somebody to be involved, you know, to make it somewhat different than the other albums and yeah, and he just came to mind and they liked the idea and uh, yeah, since I'd worked with him before and yeah, and it was, you know, it lightened up the mood a lot on our, when we're recording can get a bit grim you know me lou and murph playing the same song like 50 times yeah (laughs) because we don't practice anymore we just are immediately start recording so the first many takes are just trying to learn the song in the old days we would have practiced and know the songs before we start recording sure but now we just feel like oh we might as well just record it and so it's Makes it a lot seem a lot more tedious because you're in recording the same song for a while until it gels together. You know, like uh, the drum parts I have in mind for Murph, it takes him a while to sink into his head. You know. Sure, sure. And you said Kurt would sort of help lighten up the mood in some ways. He kind of have a, a fresh, fresh set of ear or a fresh, you know, uh, vibe. Yeah, exactly. You know, he's cracked some jokes. and He's a funny dude, it, se- it seems to me. Yeah. yeah, I know a lot of people are surprised from his music what he's like when you meet him. It's, you know, some people can't reconcile the two, the person and his music. Oh, like, that's the guy who does that music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you, I mean, that's that's something that is is uh, um, I think about how you two sort of have a um, you two share a little bit of 
a certain common ground. I mean, there's certain kind of like Neil Young and country thing that it seems like you guys share. But but beyond that, there's a sort of this um, thing that happens when you embrace the a, a sort of simplicity or a repetition, you know, in like a lick. You guys both kind of do that a lot. I was thinking about how one of the things I revisited was your your Jay and friends sing and chant for Ama, which is dedicated to. Yeah. How, how do I say uh, Ama's Ama's name? The uh, her full title. Her full title is uh, Mata Amritanandamai. Yeah. I'm usually people call her Amachi. I I really liked that one, um, and I had somehow missed it when it originally came out. Um, but I wonder, does do you ever approach that? Was it almost like musical meditation? Before I make any assumptions, is that sort of the the idea there that the chanting and what you were doing on that? Oh uh, yeah, in a way, yeah, it's like a spiritual practice. Yeah, I guess. Does does that ever enter into your your records with Dinosaur Junior or or any of the side projects or anything? Is that something that creeps in in there? for you at least personally yeah we could creep in a little bit yeah 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 do i i feel like um you know your, your spiritual practice uh is i i wonder if, if if you don't mind telling me a little bit about it unless it feels too weird to talk about something so personal Yeah, I guess it seem feels a little weird. I don't know what to say about it, really. Well, I, yeah, I, well, we could maybe stick more with a with some more specifics. Do you do you do you meditate generally? You're like, is that a, a something that you do on a daily basis? Uh, not anymore. Yeah, I guess since I had a kid. Before I had a kid, I was more kind of doing it a lot, but uh. Now more sporadically. Yeah, because you've got a person who needs your attention. <laughs> uh, I mean, a fair amount of time, I imagine. Yeah, and I don't know. But, you know, I keep it in mind. Sure, sure. That's a cool record, and and... It, and and I mean, yeah. And then there is there is the song on the fog, which also references the the first fog record that also references her, which is is like an interesting. I think that that's a really that's a really. Um, it seems to me like Dinosaur Junior doesn't necessarily explore the same sort of thematic, yeah. you know, scope. But it, there 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 is always sort of this like. Uh, there's a sort of recognition of of your place in the universe. I even think of the title, Sweep It Into Space, you know, just sort of this, like, uh, wondering where, you know, when you sit down to write a song, what that usually usually looks like. You mentioned that you guys don't necessarily have the songs down when you start, when you head into the studio. Do you usually have, like, the lyrics written up? No. So you have to do that on the on the spot to some degree? Yeah, after the take is done and I have to sing it, I'll, then I'll have to write the lyrics. Yeah. Do you usually have something at least in a in like a, like a placeholder lyric, or or do you just sort of come to it whole cloth and approach it after it's done? I might have a phrase or something, and <clears throat> lately I'd end up use try end up using the phrase I've been singing to try to fit into the lyrics or something yeah yeah well we talked a little bit about some of some of your early days i wonder if if um we could go back a little bit to to earlier in your your life and you could tell me who some of the guitarists were that made you want to first play music uh well when i played drums i liked uh I wanted to be in between Charlie Watts, Ian Pace, and John Bonham. Those were my. Those I was are trying your... to be somewhere in between those. And uh, guitar, when it was like um, Ron Ashton, Greg Sage from the Wipers, and 
Keith and Mick Taylor from the Stones. Those were kind of my things I was trying to combine. You 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 were always pretty into into the Stones. It seems they're that like pretty uh, yeah. yeah. Did you sort of like would you would you learn to play a lot of that stuff at the time? Uh no, I never learned any songs on guitar particularly unless they just kind of came to me. Sure. Easily sure. I never sat down and tried to learn. I remember one wiper song just came to me really easily and I was sort of amazed by that, but uh well, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I never tried. I mean, I did try to play a lot of songs when I was learning drums. I learned a lot of songs. But with guitar, I was just trying to write songs. And I didn't know how to play well enough to really copy stuff. I wasn't really... Yeah, I just picked up the guitar to, to write songs and be in a band. So I didn't... I wasn't trying to play other people's songs. What uh? Do you remember what what your first guitar was? What was the first guitar that you got your hands on? Like the model. I mean, the first one I bought was a Jazzmaster. Uh, I borrowed some before that. Like I had Lou. I borrowed a Hondo Les Paul that Lou had when we were in Deep Wound. And I think I had some Sears guitar somebody gave me, but. Where where were Hondo Hondos made? Are those are they Japanese? Am I is that Yeah. Yeah. But they're like they're pretty okay copies, right? Uh generally. Uh, it wasn't too good. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 when you got a jazz master, um were you sort of already involved in the hardcore uh, yeah, you you'd said you'd already been playing in Deep Wound. Were j- jazz masters weren't really the most common guitar in that scene, I don't imagine. No, I got the guitar for to form Dino, and uh, yeah, I thought just from the, my concept of what the band was going, I thought a Fender would be good. I don't know why I thought, because I wanted to s- do kind of strumming. I don't know. I just thought I should get a Fender and. Uh, that was the one I could afford. They were cheap back then, and um, yeah, I just kind of learned how to play on that guitar. What? What? How has it felt like having Fender come to you and and ask about you know make signature models and stuff? You've got a Squire signature model and a, and a Fender. Um, yeah. Has that been pretty? Is that kind of a cool, gratifying thing? Thinking back on those early days when you got a Jazzmaster and then eventually. They've got your name on one. Is that a pretty cool feeling? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty weird. Yeah, how did that? How did that work? Did they? Did they call you and get ideas for the guitar or you know specs or anything like that? Yeah. Actually, the first guy that approached me was, I guess, Fender was in Arizona at that time. A guy from Arizona, and uh, um. Yeah, I just said I want this and that. Nothing too crazy. But, yeah. Uh, jumbo frets and um, I don't know. Just sort of your mm. the the stuff that you we, we, I mean, you have a pretty fair amount of guitars. Is there ever a, a is there a thing that you could say you're looking for in a guitar? that inspires you to, to find one or, or, uh, what, you know, how, how do you go about collecting guitars if there's any sort of metric or guideline? Well, I guess at first you're just trying to cover all the sounds like yeah. having, you know, having a palette to work from like, Oh, I want to ha- be able to get this sound and that sound. And, um, so that's kind of where it starts trying to get all trying to get all the sounds that I might want and then now I also think if the guitar might have any songs in it or not that's a big consideration for me that's also I like old guitars I think maybe some of them could have a lot of songs in them or something 
you know what's funny is that I I would almost like I wonder if there's a part of me that would have thought yeah that seems like a weird way to think about it but I I actually picked up a, a guitar a very very old guitar recently from yeah. the from the 50s and I got a sense of exactly what you're talking about this feeling of like wow like this thing's been used to make music for a really really long time like somehow something might maybe something does get in there you know um Right. You'll have a sense of that when you when you look at something or or play something, maybe. You're hoping, yeah. It's hard to tell exactly, but uh, yeah, certain guitars just feel good, and your hope when something will come of it. Yeah. When you guys went into the studio for this, did you bring a lot of guitars or? Uh, or do you sort of show up and use what they have at the studio? What's your What's your approach as far as is getting that? Because you have a pretty dialed in signature sound, you know. But I'm sure you also are interested in exploring different tones and different palettes and all that stuff. So, what's your approach when you do? You usually have like a sort of in mind, like I think these are the guitars that I'm mostly going to use on on a, on a, any given project. Oh, yeah, that's what, I guess it depends on the song, too. You go, oh, this might sound good on this song. And and then I'll have some, or the song I've written, that, I mean, the guitar I've written the song on, I might want to use that on it. And I have some new guitars that I might just want to use. Yeah. I mean, they also like practical reasons. Like I had a St. Vincent guitar that was Ernie Ball gave me, and uh, it just plays way more in tune than like an older guitar. So if I have a capo on the ninth fret, you know, a lot of the old guitars won't really play too well in tune up there. So yeah, this new guitar plays like perfectly in tune and so i'd use that have, have you ever run into saint vincent like backstage or something and said like hey i use your guitar i have met her but before i had her guitar yeah yeah that would i mean that that probably would be a, a, a good topic of conversation but uh but that's cool those things are really interesting looking very very interesting shape yeah um you had mentioned that that Ron Ashton was one of the the big guitar guys for you. Um, how did you how did you first how did you first meet him? And then you know how did you guys start playing together for the time that you did? Well, I met him. He was recording with Don Fleming and Steve Shelley <clears throat> for the Velvet Goldmine movie. I think I met him and. Uh, yeah, his sound on the first Stooges album, that's like the holy grail sound that I'm always chasing, kind of. And uh, then when I, and Mike Watt played on that record too. So when I was touring with Mike Watt and when we played in Ann Arbor, I was I said, hey, Mike, you should call up Ron and we have him come down and jam because we were doing a couple Stooges songs because Watt always liked to sing Stooges stuff. And then just from there, I just played with him more and more. Kinda. Was What was it like to, to play with somebody who sort of had like a formative influence? Were you surprised by anything that you saw him doing or tricks that, you know, from having listened to the records, you assumed you knew what he was doing, but then when you're standing next to him, you realize it's a whole different approach or things like that? Yeah, it's, it was cool to learn how to how he played the songs and and that just he you know didn't seem like he had lost anything like he just sounded the same kind of when he played like in the I don't know if he's just been playing in his basement for years but he's still as good as he was back then. It's cool to see just. You know, just see that him play in person. Yeah, I did. I did an interview with the uh, two of the two of the guys from Teenage Fan Club, and and I was talking with them about how they had, 
they had played with Alex Chilton, you know, and I was yeah. In my in my brain, I I I was so hung up on like so what was it like to play with somebody who was like a hero and they were like, "Well, it was great and we loved playing with Alex, but the key to doing it is that we didn't we didn't ask him weird questions about what it was like to be in Big Star or or anything like that. We just we just played music with him, you know? We just tried to respect the the moment. And I wonder if it was similar for you with Ron where it was just a thing of um you're just focused on what's happening. I mean, is it easy is it easy to be in the moment when something like that's happening and, you know, it could be very uh tempting to lapse into a sort of I can't believe this is going on sort of thing. Uh I think I probably felt more comfortable with uh, Ron than they might have felt with <laughs> with Alex Chilton, but uh, yeah, I could ask him any question or yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't that weird. It was just, he was psyched that he was playing and that people liked him and yeah, and uh, and this and like his brother Scott Ashton when we started playing with him I really got along with him too I just felt like they were you know easy guys to hang out with they weren't they weren't like each other but they were both easy to hang out with yeah yeah you've you've worked a lot with Mike Watt right when did you guys first meet uh I mean when he was in Firehose I had seen Minutemen a few times and I met D Boone but I and I gave him a Deep Wound record but I didn't talk to Mike Watt until I guess he was in Firehose and I don't know if I saw them or we played with them or but yeah, that's when I first met him. He's a guy who it seems like he's just inexhaustible in terms of his energy. Is that a pretty exciting thing in a collaborator, somebody who is that sort of jazz to to make stuff? Sure, that that always helps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it seems to me like like when you when you step when you when you're when you're off with with various bands. Like I'm thinking of all sorts of stuff. I'm thinking of the is it sw- the Sweet Apple record comes to mind. Like all this stuff. Like where you you'll go off and you'll do something. Um, or thinking about which, you know, you play drums in which, how, how often do you, do you play drums these days? I play a little bit, you know, I just kind of try to play a couple minutes a day or something, just kind of bang around a little bit. Do you have, do you have any projects that you're, you're playing drums on right now? Yeah, just the solo album. I was playing drums. So you're working on another another solo album? Oh, you you'd already mentioned that. And yeah. an and an instrumental record. Oh yeah, I played drums on that too, yeah. What's the what's the vibe of this instrumental record? Is it pretty is it is it a is it in in all focused in one sort of zone or is it all over the place? What's the the feel? Yeah, it's a little all over the place. The first Heavy Blanket album was kind of more sounded all the same, but this one's a little bit different. And a couple of the songs uh, I recorded with the intention of being a witch album, but the singer couldn't didn't want to sing on stuff he hadn't written or something, and we just never did anything with him. And then there's just some more, a song that I was trying to kind of a tribute in my mind to Fleetwood Mac, um, Danny Kerwin kind of his songs. That's cool. That's not the, that's not always the, there's always so many, there's so many different eras of Fleetwood Mac, you know, but the Danny Kerwin stuff is, is really cool. I can't remember if he's on that future games album. That's a really cool one. I think he is. Anyway. Yeah, I'm I'm fuzzy on that too. I mostly listen to it, the Peter Green ones he's on. Oh, sure, sure. Was P- is P- was Peter Green a pretty big influence? Uh, I mean, back when you were, when you were growing up, or did that did that show up no, later? 
Much later, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like, yeah, it's funny how things come in. Like, I remember when Alex Chilton and Big Star became like a... That when I started listening to that or different things like it's like our first tour without Lou and we had um Donna Biddle we went to Australia that's when I first started listening to big stars and I don't know yeah different periods I remember getting into but yeah Fleetwood Mac was definitely way later yeah did you have any of the sort of like typical when when you were younger, did you have the sort of punk aversion to things like that, or was or were you ever really? Did you get sort of hung up on the punk dogma side of things at any point in your life? Yeah, at some point, I just couldn't understand why you'd want to listen to any other music but hardcore. Yeah, I was kind of sold some of my records. I was really focused. I'm like, that was really just happening all around me. That's what I was into, and I just couldn't understand. All the old stuff I listened to, I just kind of wasn't really, yeah, I just couldn't understand it anymore. I was just really focused on that. But then I got, it kind of seemed to end, and then I wasn't into it anymore. Then I was trying to figure out what to be into because I still like music. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of when the birthday party came in. They were like a, a big band for post hardcore people i think it's just like the net the step out of hardcore into other music or something did it did it was was encountering that stuff did it still sound almost like because it is obviously a step away from hardcore but it's still really commanding and powerful and all that stuff did it sort of feel almost like a bridge into into other stuff i guess so it just seemed like hardcore ended one day and if you still want to listen to music, it's like, oh yeah, this seems like a good place to start. At that, at that point, did you did you start expanding in a lot of different directions? When did sort of the more post punky stuff, like interest in the Cure or something like that, sort of come in? Oh, that was like kind of around and before punk, all that kind. Of, sure, and, sure. And all the post-punk stuff I was listening to during punk. and So I guess after the post-hardcore period, I started listening to a lot of... There's also a lot of the bands like uh, that sounded kind of like R.E.M., like The Neats and R.E.M. and Green on Red and Dream Syndicate. Those kind of bands and... Uh, and I like New Order and, you know, and I, the birthday party was the big thing, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. That whole thing, like green on red and, and, and the sort of psychedelic, slightly slight psychedelic tinge stuff, Paisley Underground maybe is what some people would call it. That's yeah. interesting that there was a little bit of that because it feels like the psychedelic elements are, are, are all always there in, in Dinosaur Jr. Almost from the, from the beginning, there's at least touches of that. And that's a pretty interesting thing. Did you feel, I mean, were, were bands like, uh, you know, the SST bands, it felt like they sort of, once the hardcore thing, the template was established, everybody broke it and just moved in different directions. Did you like records like the, the set, like the Black Flag records where they it's almost experimental improv and stuff. Like I'm thinking of like Family Man. Were you were you kind of turned on by the fact that people were exploring different um templates and, and, and blowing the format up a little bit? Yeah, if it was good, you know. Yeah. Black Flag, yeah, it was like sort of hit and miss. Like I liked some of this some of it and of course, I liked their earlier stuff, but yeah, as they went on, I liked some songs and then some songs I didn't like. And sure. But yeah, I was open to anything that I, if I liked it. Yeah. 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 How about the influence of, of you know, you covered Mazzy Star on a, uh, on a record and that was a really cool, a cool cover was the sort of 
quote unquote slow core thing that was sort of happening like you, you know dinosaur jr was was pretty much sort of in in that slipstream to some degree uh but it's not always what people would think about was was that sort of were you interested in in bands that were oh, yeah well like he was a you know in rain parade i like that when mm-hmm. dream syndicate was out and stuff so yeah i liked his stuff for sure yeah yeah how about how what how did it feel when you first heard my my bloody valentine did you did you like loveless yeah but i like stuff before loveless better i guess yeah yeah uh, cuz uh, uh yeah i met him they came to see us the first time we were in england and then some journalist said I should listen to it. They were at our show, and you should check out this record. And I, that's still my favorite record. The first one I got, um, that song "Thorn." I really like this. E- that's the first EP I got. Mm. Uh, I guess it's "You Make Me Realize" EP, and uh, and then I like the their first album. But the thing with Loveless is like I really like the drums and bass going crazy, and then the Kevin and Belinda just standing there singing. And but with Loveless, it was kind of like you know, Colin was having a hard time. There wasn't any drums; it was all drum machine stuff. So that element of it, I wasn't as into. But I liked a lot of the songs, but. Yeah, I liked the crazy drumming behind it better from before. Do you feel like as you started off as a drummer? I mean, when you when you put on a record, when you put on a record, I'm sure the, you're listening to the overall record. But I'm curious if, as a listener, do your ears sort of focus in on the drums initially on stuff, or do they focus in? Is there any specific element that you? start once you get past the sort of hey this is a cool song you know do you start listening for specific things in music no just whatever jumps out yeah sure sure well this record is like i said it's it's really cool and it's exciting that that you guys um continue to 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 do this stuff um and and i i to close i was i was wondering if we could discuss you mentioned, you know, how things are... I, I'm curious, without fully formed songs necessarily, what informs the decision for Dinosaur Jr. to say, all right, let's go make another record? Is there any one specific thing that sort of triggers it? Or um, do you just somehow know? I mean, do you guys talk back and forth and it presents itself when it's right? How does it? How does it work for you guys? A lot of it, it's kind of like... It's back to the old, you know, the SST days when they would say, like Mike Watt would say, the record's a flyer for the gig. Like, yeah. like the first Dino record we made before we played many gigs, it was just it was just so that we had something to give to clubs and so you could get gigs. So it kind of feels like that again. It's like the record is just, oh, we want to tour some more, so we should make a new record so we can tour more. That's kind of the basic impetus. Yeah. Once we're burnt out from touring on the previous record and feel like we, you know, we need some new songs to keep touring and like a new kick. The album's like a kickoff to start touring again and have some new songs. Yeah. So that's why it's weird now. It's just like... What you know? I wasn't sure we should put it out even yet, but everyone—it's been a year, so people wanted to get it out. But yeah, it seems weird to put out a record now and not be able to tour. Well, well, I hope that uh, when shows kick back up, that it'll all work out okay. Uh, In the meantime, it's exciting to have this record, and I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me about it. All right, cool. Cool. Thanks, Jay. All right, thanks. See you later. Bye.
Jay Maskus in conversation. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Transmissions. It's produced, written, and hosted by me. I'm Jason Woodbury. Our audio is edited by Andrew Horton. Sarah Goldstein and Jonathan Mark Walls provide visuals. And our executive producer and top of the show announcer is Aquarium Drunkard founder Justin Gage. Tune in every Wednesday night for his weekly serious XMU show, The Aquarium Drunkard Show, Best in the Satellite Biz. I hope you enjoyed this one. I'll remind you once again that we rely on word of mouth around here, so if you can spread the word, please do. We'll be back next Wednesday with another strange conversation for our continually strange times. Our guest next week is guitar legend Richard Thompson, sharing reflections on his new book, Bees Swing, Losing My Way and Finding My Voice, 1967 to 1975. If you're a fan of that early Fairport convention and Brit folk stuff, and I know I am, you're going to want to listen in on this one. Until then, stay safe, keep cool. If you need more transmissions, there's plenty to hear in the archives. So dig in. We've been doing the show for a few years now, and there are a lot of talks that you might have missed. So check them out. Talk again soon. Be well. Let's go.